College is currently working on her master's. And today she's here to talk about the history of African Americans in Cedar Rapids and the impact they've had on our community. So you guys would please welcome Crystal Bud. Yeah, can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. All right. So we have a little teachers. If you still have some of the yellow tickets in your classroom, would you please send those down here with a student? Thank you. So technically, I know the session doesn't begin until ten. Should I? Wait until 10 to start, or should I? Um, I think you can go ahead and start yeah, early. Okay. I, they were, I heard them talking to across the hall. Since people are here, if you want to start, this fine. Awesome. Because um, we have a lot of content to cover, and we'll be looking at kind of a timeline of African American history in Iowa, because there are going to be a lot of things that are happening, not just in Cedar Rapids, but in different parts of the state that kind of talk and show the long history and the struggles and the fights for civil rights that African Americans have had within the state. So some of these things are happening in different cities in the state of Iowa, but have an impact on the state overall. So before we jump into some of that specific content, um, you guys were all in the sort of opening breakout session with Stacy Walker. Any thoughts, feelings, responses, questions, concerns? Anything in particular you guys are looking to take away from this today? Because I know this is something new. Uh, when Ms. Erickson approached me about six or seven months ago. Uh, we hadn't, the museum hadn't had an opportunity to be involved with anything like this with students here. So we were really excited to bring this content out. And I was really glad that Stacy sort of brought up a good point in talking about this content. We are at a school where there is not a ton of African American representation, not a ton of diversity. Um, I am not from Iowa in general. My family is from North Carolina, so talking about things that are happening in North Carolina. My parents were born in their early 50s. They were um, born to poor families. Hey folks, hey, this is uh, Mr. Tady here, and just wanted to uh, give a heads up that I'll be bouncing in and out of classrooms, doing some uh, video recording, uh, except those that I requested not to. Um, also with those speakers that I come in and video record, I'll try to catch you a little bit later um, to do a little mini interview with you as well. So students and, and uh, speakers, please uh, pardon my interruption as I come in and out. Just um, keep on with your business. Thanks, everyone. I forgot that was video. I should have worn more makeup. <laughs> uh, um, but my family, they were poor sharecropping families from North Carolina. So part of my interest in going into public history and going to the museum field and interest in working at an African American museum or working at other museums where I've actually worked and done research on African American exhibits is because I see my family reflected in this story. All the things that I've learned, things that I've learned to deal with, conversations I've had, things my parents have prepared me for. And as Stacy mentioned, these things didn't just stop after 1954, 1964, 1968. When I was getting ready, I graduated from a small women's African American, struggling black university in Atlanta, Georgia, Spelman College. And as I was getting ready to go to grad school, about to start my master's in public history, I'm working at J.C. Penney's, an older white gentleman who is asking me about, you know, where am I from? I'm not originally from Florida. My dad's military, so we've moved around a lot of places in and out of country. And as I'm talking to him and his granddaughter. One of the things that he mentioned was like, it's so good that we have affirmative action so you can go to schools like Indiana University. Nothing about my merit, nothing about the fact that I graduated with honors, that I graduated with nearly a 4.0 in my field, that I had internships and volunteer work in museums, that I had glowing recommendations, that I've held a job every summer, every winter throughout the year since I was 16 years old. One of the few people that they brought back to the JCPenney's where I was working because my boss told me that it was hard to find excellent customer service associates, so she recommended that I come back to the same department, same store, every summer, every winter that I was an undergrad. My accomplishments meant nothing, but the fact that I was black, the fact that I was a woman, I was a diversity check for the school, so that must be why I got in. And this is happening, this conversation is happening summer of 2010, eight years ago. So when we talk about this, even though we're mostly going to be talking in a historic context, think about the fact that these things, this is basically a foundation for things that are still relevant. And it's not just 
for black people. There's legislation that's going against people that are from Middle Eastern countries, those who practice the Muslim faith, those who are Latinx, those who are Asian American, those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, those who come from non-traditional homes, everybody who doesn't fit this very small mold that was sort of established in the 16 and 1700s has some sort of issue, something about them, something that they have to get past. So we're just talking from the lens of African American history in Iowa because with the population being so small, people tend to assume, and I always get the question, one, there are black people in Iowa, is there enough there to talk about and for us to have a whole museum? And the reality is some of the things that I'm gonna tell are happening here in Iowa before you see other states in the United States doing it, before you see the federal government passing similar legislation. So Iowa is a place where you do have people, boots on the ground, who are fighting for access to live in this space, to exist in this space, and who are really making changes that you see rolling into federal changes on the national level. So that being said, for those of you that have never been, this is a picture of the museum where we're located right off of the Cedar River in downtown Cedar Rapids. If you've ever been to or seen the Czech and Slovak Museum, we are literally right across the bridge from them. We've been in this building. This year we're celebrating our 25th anniversary as a museum, our 15 years in this building. So it's going to be a very exciting year for us. A lot of new things that we're bringing in, cool programs, cool speakers. I've been celebrating 25 years of collecting, preserving, and sharing all of this history. So when we look at African American history and this engagement with Iowa, you really kind of have to go back to Lewis and Clark. And I'm the type of person, when I do these tours and do these programs, I get tired of listening to myself talk for 45 to 50 minutes. So we're going to do a little question and answer. It's not a quiz, it's not a test. Don't worry about getting things wrong. Because I want to know what you guys know. So when I say Lewis and Clark, what do you know about this narrative? Why do we study this? Why is this important? Uh, so it's basically these two guys trying to find a waterway that would go basically from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean on the other side of the continent. And why were they doing that? Because it would have been good for a trade route and just easily access that. All right. It's always good to talk to older students because when we do this for third graders, they have no idea, no clue about who Lewis and Clark are, why they're important. When this happened, they all often think that Martin Luther King Jr. freed the slaves. Third graders have a hard time with chronology. Now, Lewis and Clark are going on this huge expedition because the U.S. just purchased what? What do we have now? Louisiana Purchase. All right. We're more than doubling the size of the United States. Now, how many of you guys have talked about the Lewis and Clark expedition in school? Even if you don't remember all the details, how many of you talked about this in class before? It's one of those things that, you know, if you're interested in history, you remember most of the time. If you're not really interested in history, you know it existed and it kind of fades into the background. Now, how many of you, you know the names Lewis and Clark, right? How many of you heard Sacagawea? All right, who can just brief, simple explanation? Who was Sacagawea? She was like their guide, I guess, and like supposed to be someone talking to the Native American. Mm -hmm. So Native American woman who helped guide them through, um, helped them with communication, with a lot of the language. She knew the land, she knew the spaces. Now, how many of you have ever heard the name York before in relationship to Lewis and Clark? All right, so a couple of people know the story of York. This is wonderful because he's one of those people who is an integral part of this story and has huge national and local significance that people rarely talk about. So now those who said that they knew about York, what did you know about him? What did you learn about him? He was uh, one of the first ever African-American people to be allowed to vote in some capacity. Yes, so we'll get to that, but you are correct. Today. Legally, he was a slave, but like basically, he treated people over their expedition. So, York had a very interesting role. He was a slave who belonged to William Clark. They were essentially about the same age, and of course, whenever William Clark becomes an adult man, he's given York to be his manservant. Now, while they're on this expedition, and this is an image that has been traveled throughout a number of art museums, and there's an artist rendering based on a lot of the documentation on a lot of the journals that were left by members of the expedition. Now, York was extremely helpful with Lewis and Clark, of course, helping with a lot of the physical labor. He was actually pretty good at picking up the languages of a lot of Native American people that were living in this now giant piece of land 
that the U.S. now owns. But look at what they're doing to them in the picture. What are they doing? And the answer is probably simpler than you think. And if it seems like a really simple basic answer, you're probably right. They're looking at him. All right, so they're looking at him. And focus your attention on the two fingers in the middle. What are they doing? Touching. Say it louder for the people touching back. Him. They're touching. And again, people always assume that's not the right answer just because it seems so simple. They are touching his skin. Now think about the fact that this is the early 1800s. A lot of these Native American people who are living in the middle and western part of the US have never had a chance to engage with anybody of African descent. So what's gonna be the most unique feature about York? His skin. His skin. If you're living and you've never seen a black person before, then that complexion, which is something that you don't traditionally see, is gonna be unique. And that was one of the other reasons that having York and having Sacagawea made Lewis and Clark seem less combative whenever they're engaging and meeting these various Native American groups in these different parts of the land. And York was so intriguing because they would always try to touch his skin because they didn't know if that was something that was naturally occurring or something that he would put on topically that would make his skin that color. And then they're looking at his size, how broad and tall he was. They were really intrigued just by his physical makeup and physical stature. Now, whenever they get all the way up to the West Coast, they have to figure out where they're going to spend the winters of 1805 and 1806. They know they're not going to be able to make it back all the way across the United States before the coldest, harshest part of winter hits. And so they get a vote on where they're going to spend the winter. So as this gentleman here on my right side mentioned, what this does, because everybody in that expedition gets an equal vote, this means that York is going to be the first person of African descent to get to vote in any official government capacity national significance. Now this is before they're making any laws about African American suffrage, African American men's right to vote, or not allowing them any right to vote. But again, the land that now makes up the state of Iowa is also part of the Louisiana Purchase. So as far as we know, York is going to be the first African American to ever set foot in what is now the state of Iowa. Local significance. Now, everybody else, they get money, and they get land whenever they go back and they report to the US government, to the president, what they found in this territory, the feasibility of this land, the potential of this land. What happens to York? I know you guys know this. What did he start off this expedition as? Slave. He started as a slave. So what does he end this expedition as? still ends in his property of William Clark. So he spends the next 10 years asking for his freedom. Now, during this time, William Clark even gets so exasperated with continuously having to tell York no that he sends him to work for another slave owner just to get a break from the continuous petition. And that slave owner actually works him even harsher than he's getting work for William Clark. And he's hoping that it will sort of break this repetitive cycle of him asking for his freedom. But after 10 years, a decade of asking for his freedom, he's no longer listed as property of William Clark and gets to spend the last 15 years of his life as a free person. Now that sounds wonderful if you think about in relationship to when he was born, which we estimate to be around 1770, being a part of this huge national expedition that goes down in history, more than doubles the size of the United States, and then still only gets to spend 15 years of his life treated like a human being instead of being treated like property. Now, when we think about this grand timeline of slavery in the United States, you're talking 1619, when you have the first African slaves who are coming to the United States, to 1865. So this is a long-standing system that is essentially at the core and at the foundation of the establishment of the United States. Now, whenever they open up the Iowa Territory, even though many people tend to assume that it was a sort of all-inviting, all-encompassing space, they still open this territory with policies that 
worked against African Americans who wanted to move here. One specifically that you see on the bottom right side, the paying a fee to enter the state. Now, of course, you have all of these policies that you see in many territories that are being opened up. African Americans cannot attend public school. They can't sit under jury. They can't testify in court because they were thought of as being um, non-trustworthy and that there was a potential that they were going to lie or falsify any sort of evidence or any verbal witness. They couldn't serve in the military. They could not have any romantic relationship with a white person, could not marry a white person, could not vote. And then there was a fee that they were supposed to pay, $550, if they wanted to enter the territory. Now, this was kind of like a security deposit. They had no idea what was gonna happen when African Americans got here to settle in Iowa, but just in case anything happened, they wanted to have that $550 for them even being allowed to come and settle to start life in the territory of Iowa. Now, when we start looking at policies and laws that relate to Iowa and African Americans, one of the first big ones that you see, which actually ends up being the first Supreme Court case in Iowa, actually has to do with the system of slavery. Now, was Iowa a slaveholding territory and slaveholding state? They were not. But that conversation around slavery and that system of slavery, especially directly south of us in Missouri, has a large impact on some of the things that are affecting the African American community in the state of Iowa. And this is one of the big ones. Now, Ralph was a slave that belonged to a slave owner, Mr. Montgomery, down in Missouri. And he was given an agreement that he was able to take four years to buy his freedom, about $550. He could work wherever, he could go wherever, he could settle wherever, but he could go to the free states, work for four years, make $550, and buy his way into freedom. Now, once you get to the end of the four years, his slave owner, Mr. Montgomery, is actually running into a little bit of financial debt on his plantation. Since slave catchers up at the end of that four years, up to Dubuque, Iowa, where Ralph has found really good work in some of the lead mines. Now, some of the people that are working with him, both black and white, see that these slave catchers are coming, hear that they're looking for Ralph, and before they let them take Ralph out of the state, they tell them that they have to go see the Justice of the Peace. Now, this is something that you see in quite a few areas, especially when you start talking about the Underground Railroad in places like Salem that we'll talk about. Going to see the Justice of the Peace was something that, especially people who were on the side of various African Americans who were living here or people who were working as abolitionists would do a lot. So they go to see the Justice of the, of the Peace and they have a decision that they have to make in Iowa. A lot of the judges who are actually gonna hear this case happen to be a lot of the district territorial Supreme Court justices. So they go ahead and decide to make this a territorial Supreme Court case. Now, the presiding justice knows that this decision is gonna be huge for the state of Iowa because on one side they're saying that legally you can count Ralph as a fugitive slave. And the US government has their Fugitive Slave Act. I haven't even talked about the Fugitive Slave Act before. I've heard of the Fugitive Slave Act. All right, so some iffy. So the Fugitive Slave Act were laws that were passed in the United States that basically said if you were property, if you were a slave, no matter where you were in the United States, whether you were in a slaveholding or a non-slaveholding state, you were legally still property of that slave owner. So just being in a northern state, just residing in Iowa, wasn't enough for you to be considered free. Now, on the other side, Rob lawyer was saying that because he was allowed to enter a legal agreement to take up residency in a non-slave holding state, then he can technically sue for his right to be free. Now the justices are going back and forth about this because this is gonna set a precedent for how Iowa handles itself because as far as they know for the foreseeable future, slavery is going to be an established part of the United States. They don't know that the Civil War is coming. They don't know that abolition is coming. But they end up deciding on July 4th of 1839, that Ralph, a man of color, is free by the state of the law. And as we go forward in talking about that conversation of slavery, this sort of establishes the territory as a non-slaveholding state and sort of sets a precedent for some of the activity that you see, especially when you go into the 1840s and 1850s and looking at underground world activity that's happening and some of those major moments on the Underground Railroad, both on a local and a national level, including raids and movements by people like John Brown. 
is because of this. Now, the interesting thing that happens between this case and then the cases of Dred Scott, who have very similar circumstances, Dred Scott suing for the exact same thing, on paper, these two cases are practically identical. But one of the things that happens on the national level is that they start adding extra addendums to the Fugitive Slave Act. So now, just going to northern states, just going to northern territories, really is not enough to hold a candle against the Federal Slave Act. So anybody who's suing for their right to freedom because they've taken up residence in a non-slave holding state, like Ralph, they can't do it. So Ralph gets his freedom, Dred Scott does not. They even use Ralph's case as an example whenever they're trying to fight for the Dred Scott's right to freedom. But the government still says no. Now, everybody, probably since elementary school, has talked about the Underground Railroad. You guys have probably talked about this multiple times, every single year, every grade, between about second or third grade to now. How many of you have talked about the Underground Railroad in Iowa specifically? How many of you even knew the Underground Railroad ran through Iowa? All right, oh thank goodness, that makes me feel better. Now, one of the interesting things when you look at the past in Iowa is most people traditionally think about the Underground Railroad going north, and if you were in one of your southeastern states, then you do have a lot of states that are primarily heading north and heading to Canada. Versus in Iowa, those trails are mainly headed west to east. Now, like I mentioned, where you see on the bottom right corner of that map of Iowa, that big blue circle, is the area of Salem. Now, Salem was a very large Quaker settlement, and Quakers are known for being very strong abolitionists. And so they were one of the few places where you have these great narratives and a few documented cases, but of course, most of the activity on the Underground Railroad goes vastly undocumented, but a few documented cases of slave catchers following slaves escaping from Missouri into Salem and every single time are stopped by the townspeople and forced to go see the Justice of the Peace, who most likely is also a Quaker, living in a predominantly abolitionist town in a non-slaveholding state who nine times out of 10 is going to allow those people to continue on their journey and allow them to go free because they see no legal reason to stop them in Iowa. Now, the woman that you see at the bottom is a woman named Charlotte Piles, who when most people think about African-American women who are active on the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman is the first woman who comes to mind. There's a lot that's documented about her activities, her life, the number of slaves that she freed making trips from south to north is unprecedented. But Charlotte Piles, although she worked for a much shorter amount of time, did act as a shepherd on the Underground Railroad down in Keokuk, Iowa, and started to be referred to as Grandma Piles. Now, she's one of the few documented African-American women who was active doing this in the state of Iowa. She's not originally from Iowa, though. Now, she experienced slavery in Kentucky, and she, her children, and her grandchildren, all 11 of them, were property of a slave owner down in Kentucky. Now, her husband was a free man. He had his free papers, but because children take the state of the mother, if the mother's a slave, that child automatically becomes property of the slave owner to be used, traded, sold, what have you. Now, Charlotte Piles, her children, her grandchildren, are given to this man's daughter as he's on his deathbed. He knows his daughter is an abolitionist. He knows that most likely she is gonna have her freedom, she, her children, and her grandchildren, in the next couple of years, if not sooner. But this young woman also has brothers who are not abolitionists, who don't wanna see that system of slavery end, who get into a little bit of gambling debt, take Charlotte's biological son, and trade them to pay off their debt. Now, this woman accompanies Charlotta, her children and her grandchildren and her husband. She has to get them out of Kentucky for them to be safe because she made a promise she wants to see them free. They get on the steamboat heading north with the original intention to head to Minnesota, but they get to Keokuk around the winter time. So Charlotta and her family, they stop in Keokuk. This woman heads and continues to go up north and heads to find a place for them to settle in Minnesota. Now, Charlotta has her husband, who's the only adult working man in the house. He's the only one who can make money, but he has to feed Charlotta, her daughters, and the grandchildren. 
we're talking 11 people outside of him that he has to feed. He's not going to be able to make enough money to sustain 11 people in the house. So Miss Powell decides she's going to go out to the East Coast and go on a speaking tour. Now she networks up with a lot of other well-known people who are speaking on the abolitionist network, including Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, and in about six weeks, makes enough money to buy back her daughter's two husbands. Now we're talking the equivalent of $3,000, $1,500 for each man, and doing this in the 1800s. Now, as a woman who's a slave and also a mother, she's faced with a really difficult decision because her biological son finds out that she's making money to free the daughter's two husbands. Writes a letter and asks her, can you make enough money, another $1,500, to buy my way out of freedom? Now remember, he's now been born into slavery, endured this system in Kentucky, been sold off to pay off somebody's debt, separated from his family, from his siblings, his mother, nieces and nephews. What do you think she says? How do you think she responds to that letter? I mean, essentially, she has two responses, either yes or no. How many of you think she says yes? I mean, she is a mother. She has made $3,000 in a matter of a couple of weeks. Three more weeks, she might be able to make more. How many of you think she says no? All right, for those who say no, why do you think she would say no? You're correct, she did say no. But why do you think she did that? Any guesses? Any thoughts? Why would a mother who was able to make enough money in a matter of a month and a half to back back to the daughter's two husbands not buy her own biological son? And even if you don't know why, Think about how difficult of a decision that was, because this is a whole nother conversation and the complexity about that system of slavery, is mothers who have to endure watching their children go through this system. And you see stories, and if you've ever watched any of the shows like Underground, or read any of the recent works that have come out, you see and kind of see visually now all of these horrible situations like mothers who would do things like, you know, hide their children, drown their children just because they are so mentally and emotionally broken from this system that they don't want to have to watch the people that they love go through it. But Charlotte's son doesn't have a spouse. He doesn't have any children. He doesn't have anybody that he has to take care of but himself. So she, in turn, has to make that difficult decision as a mother to tell him that he's going to find his own way. Now, after receiving that information, we don't find any more conversations, no more of reaching out from the mother to the son or the son to the mother. As far as we know, he never speaks to her again. But she comes back. She's able to purchase the two sons-in-laws. They take their daughters, take the families, and they can go and support their own families. And Charlotte Pyle stays in Keokuk for the rest of her life, dying in the 1870s. And she decides that she is going to, sorry, 1880, not 1879, that she's going to continue helping escaping slaves coming from Missouri and help them connect with the Underground Railroad Network that's in the southeastern part of the state. Now, of course, we know, talking about the slavery, this conversation becomes a huge national war, sparks a national war. And anybody who says that the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery, it had to do with states' rights, part of that was states' rights to own slaves. They can phrase that however they would like to. Slavery was a very large part and one of the most important reasons for the Civil War. Now, at this time, you have African American men who know that how the outcome of the Civil War is going to do what? What does the outcome of the Civil War mean for them? Wins against the South, Confederates, and uh, slavery is abolished. All right, so you two said freedom. The outcome of this war means that they either continue in a life of servitude, being brutally treated as property, as animals. And remember, this is chattel slavery, so you have a lot of this is happening with brutal treatment, their children being taken away from them, them being bred like animals, treated worse than some animals, or the union winning, and them actually having the potential of having a life as a human being. So you have African-American men who want to sign up and fight for the union. 
But the U.S. government is worried about a number of things. One is the perception that African-American men are not going to be brave enough or smart enough or skilled enough to be good soldiers. And then there was the concern of what have so much life that's lost on the side of the Union that they need more troops. So they allowed the establishment of the United States Colored Troops Regiments. And one, the 60th, is comprised of African-American men from the state of Iowa and some from Missouri. Now these men had one job. They were defending a fort in Arkansas. And they get into one big battle there. They were never intended to see battle, but the one battle they, they, they get in, these 911 men, only 11 of them die in the battle. They fight so well that the white officer writes back and says, these men fought like veterans, none flinched. Attesting to the fact that they fought like professionally trained soldiers. Yet you have 332 of these men who die not directly relating to the battle, but end up dying from illness and disease. Now one of the things that you see happening is that they're getting ill-fitted uniforms, uniforms that aren't the proper texture and aren't the proper weight for being somewhere like Arkansas in a hot, swampy area. And whenever they start requesting medications because they are the colored unit, they're getting medications that are improper, medications that are tainted, medications that are expired. Basically, all of the stuff that they can't use medically, they're sending to the USCT. So you have over a third of this regiment that die of things related to disease and illness, not from the physical battle. Now, one of the things that happens after the end of the war is that whenever these soldiers come back to the state of Iowa, they start asking for the right to vote. Now, it takes five years, and initially Iowa says no. And you have soldiers who write back, and one specifically that writes, any man that can be trusted with the musket can and ought to be trusted with the ballot. If you can trust me with a gun to fight this war, you can trust me with the right to vote. So it takes five years, but eventually the state of Iowa does finally say yes and allow African American men the right to vote. And just like Stacy mentioned at the beginning, one of the things you see is that there's a huge difference between a law being on the books, which is an amazing first step, but you still need people who are following through with that policy and making sure that those inclusive policies are actually being fleshed out and being followed. Because even in places like Iowa, you still see them initiating poll taxes and literacy tests and finding a number of obstacles to keep African Americans away from actually voting. Now, one of the people who was a prominent civil rights figure in the state of Iowa working in the 19th century is Mr. Alexander Clark. Now, Alexander Clark did a number of things, and a few of his accomplishments are here listed next to his picture. He actually funded one of the stops on the Underground Railroad because there was one that was in Muscatine. He was an entrepreneur who owned big plots of land where he grew crops and where he grew timber. But the thing that he's best known for actually has to do with his daughter, Susan Clark. Now, right after the Civil War, 1867, Alexander Clark and his family, while they're living in Muscatine, he notices and compares the school that's near his house, an all-white school, school number two, to the school that his daughter has to go to on the outskirts of the city. Now, because she's a little 12-year-old black girl, she has to go to the color school that's on the outskirts of Muscatine. He looked at the two schools and he said that school number two, the all-white school, has globes and charts and competent teachers. They have better resources. She would have access to a better education. He wants his daughter to go to that school. And of course, when he tries to enroll her in that school, what do they say? No. She's not allowed to attend that school. So Alexander Clark, being the man that he was, being the politically and civically active man that he was, he decides that he's gonna sue the Muscatine School District. But this case does not just stay within the school district, but it goes all the way up to the Iowa Supreme Court. Now, we mentioned at the very beginning, you heard Stacy mention Brown versus the Board of Education. But before that, almost 90 years before that, because of Alexander Clark's case, Iowa becomes one of the first states to have an integration policy for their schools, which happens in 1868, after he wins this case. Now again, there's a difference between having that law in the books versus having people who are actually following through with that because you have a number of schools and public institutions in Iowa where you don't see your first African-American students, where you don't see that access to education, for some of them until you get to the 1920s and 1930s. 
they would still find ways to keep students away from some of those public institutions. Now, Alexander Clark's son also has his own claim to fame, becoming the first African American to graduate from the University of Iowa School of Law. Alexander Clark Sr. thinks that's so amazing, he follows his son to the exact same law school, becomes the second African American to graduate from U of I School of Law. So whenever he dies, he has been business owner, entrepreneur, newspaper owner, civil rights activist, and then he dies after being appointed as the U.S. Ambassador to the country of Liberia, which is where he is whenever he passes, and then is brought back to the United States to be buried. So when you think of civil rights in the state of Iowa, especially when you're thinking about the 19th century, because African Americans didn't just start fighting for civil rights in the 1900s, Alexander Clark is a name that everybody who's living in Iowa who wants to know what activism looked like in Iowa needs to know Alexander Clark's name and story. Now, once you get to post-Civil War, you start to see a boom in African American population coming because now you get past the end of the Civil War and through Reconstruction, and then you get to the very end of the 1800s, and you see a number of things happening, such as jobs that are opening up, once you get to the very end of the 1800s, you have towns like Buxton that are providing opportunities, and we'll talk a little bit about Buxton in a couple of minutes. And then you have the beginnings of the Great Migration because you start to see a lot of racial segregation and Jim Crow policies and legal segregation that's taking hold of the South. So you see this booming number of thousands and tens of thousands of African Americans who start leaving the South, heading north, with this assumption that things are going to be significantly better and drastically different. Although things are different, you have a lot of African Americans who note their disappointment because they're facing the same amount of racism and segregation in northern spaces as they are in the south. But things become a little bit more heated in the south than in a lot of the northern states and northern territories. Now I mentioned Buxton, Iowa, and Buxton is sort of a unique feature for the state of Iowa because it kind of stands as this little diamond at the beginning of the 1900s. Now Buxton is a coal mining town that's established in 1899 that stands as sort of this beacon of hope, often referred to as the Black Utopia. One of the things that you see for African Americans who are moving here, they're coming to live and work in Buxton because Buxton is inviting African Americans and promising them things that a lot of other places that do actually employ African Americans and give them a, an opportunity are not offering. Equal pay, opportunities to own business, and an opportunity for an integrated and comfortable life. Now Buxton being a coal mining town, both had both black and white patrons who lived and worked and operated there. They had integrated schools, an integrated YMCA and YWCA. You had an African American woman who was a principal of an integrated school. Miss Minnie London, who you see the picture in the bottom center. But Buxton only survives for about 35 years. Now one of the great things about Buxton is you have African Americans who are coming here, not just as coal miners, but lawyers, politicians. Buxton had both a black and a white doctor. The black doctor saw more patients, both black and white patients, than the white doctor in town did. They owned pharmacies. They impacted policies. They had basketball teams, baseball teams that played other teams, especially in central Iowa. They were living a life that most African Americans in the rest of the country did not have consistent access to. And we're talking about this life going on and having this opportunity, having this nice flow of integration, of access, three and four bedroom homes, the opportunity to buy and own land, the opportunity to sell things at markets, that lasts for about 20 years. You start to see a steep decline after 20 years, partially because they start to see a lot of accidents in the mine, they close down a lot of the coal mines, and the company basically picks up the entire town of Buxton, moves it out of Iowa, and moves it to Illinois. Which means that all the African Americans that had gotten accustomed to all of this access, all of these opportunities, get dispersed into other parts of the state. And dispersed into the realities that come with segregation in the early 20th century that they're experiencing in Waterloo, and Cedar Rapids, and Des Moines, and Dubuque. You had men and women who owned businesses and worked as lawyers in Buxton who could only get jobs as cooks and servants and drivers when they got to places like Des Moines, Iowa. Children who were born in Buxton who had no idea 
what segregation was really like because they'd been insulated in this utopia who now have to go to these small, underfunded schools on the outskirts of the cities and towns where they lived at. Being told that they couldn't go to the theaters, they couldn't go to the YMCA's, they couldn't swim in the swimming pools in their neighborhoods and in their cities. They weren't used to this and this was a hard adjustment for these families. Now, one of the other interesting things where Iowa sort of stands at the forefront is when we get into World War I. With the Civil War, you now have African Americans who are able to serve in the military, but now you have African Americans who start asking about and they start looking at them to actually start leading other African American troops. Now, they want to open up this officer's training camp and they're looking at different cities and different states throughout the country where this can happen. Now, this is the 19 teens. They know that they can't do it in the South. None of the Southern states are willing. And that is just a hotbed territory to start telling people that you're gonna train African Americans to be officers. They start looking at other cities in the North, but nobody wants to take this on. There's too much racial tension in a lot of the places, especially near some of the military bases where they wanna have this happen. Iowa becomes a prime place because comparatively, race relations are a little less tense and I was one of the only states who's even willing to take this on. Now, despite that, being in Iowa still comes with this challenge for all these African American soldiers who want to get trained as officers. Because even though you have a number of them who come in, who are able to get trained and now see the opportunity of moving up in the ranks in the military, one of the things that happens within the first year of these trainees coming, you have a group of them who leave the training camp and going out in the town and they get accused of whistling at and verbally and emotionally assaulting a white woman. So what they decide to do is this doesn't even go to trial. These men don't get a fair opportunity to defend themselves and it's immediately decided that they are going to be publicly hanged. Not only are they going to be publicly hanged, they have all of the white officers who are training these African-American officers, and all of the African-American officers who are there to receive training watch this hanging. The white officers are allowed to keep their weapons. All of the black officers in training are stripped of their weapons because they don't want any emotional reactions during the hanging. Now, it's found out later after this that the accusations were false, but still being in a place like Iowa where they assumed that this would not happen, these African-American men have their lives taken without a fair trial or any sort of investigation. Now for any of you who are football fans, how many of you have ever watched a football game that's been played in the Jack Trice Stadium? Now Jack Trice is a really interesting story. It is yet another example of when you have African Americans who finally get access to some of these spaces, they sometimes feel that pressure or understand the fact that they are the only representation of their culture in a lot of these spaces. It's wonderful to be, to be the person who's the first who breaks ground. It's a lot of pressure and an extreme spotlight to be the first who's breaking that ground. Now, when Jack Trice is playing at Iowa State, he understands how important this moment is. He hasn't had a chance to play for the entire season, but once he's actually finally allowed to play in a game against the University of Minnesota, he understands that his presence on the field as the only black person there is going to be something that everybody's looking at. This is a quote from a letter that he writes to his family the night before the game. And one of the lines in there that sticks out is the one where he says, my thoughts just before the first real college game in my life, the honor of my race, my family, and myself are at stake. He's carrying a huge burden just by his presence alone on that field and understands the realities that there are gonna be many people who are very angry about the fact that they're even playing with a black football player. Now because of this, he basically gets violently and volatilely tossed around that field. Externally, he looks fine, nothing different from the kind of scrapes that you'd incur from a high contact sport. Internally, they had no idea that he was actually starting to suffer some internal bleeding. Now by the time the game's over, they get back on the bus, headed back to school, and immediately once they return, Jack Trice is hospitalized. Now within a couple of days, 
He ends up dying from the severe amount of internal bleeding that he sustained from how brutally he was hit, especially in the midsection. Now, one of the first things that happens is that a couple decades after, they actually petitioned for there to be a statue of Jack Trice that's put on Iowa State's campus. Now, at this time, it's not close to the stadium. It's a little bit further away from the stadium. About 20 years later, they have another petition, which is when they rename the stadium after Jack Trice and move his statue out in front of the stadium. Now, we've gotten to the middle of the 1900s, 1940s, and now you have another set of progress for African Americans in the military. But now it's not only being allowed to be trained as officers, not only being allowed into the military, but now that they've offered up and they've opened up the U.S. Army Air Corps, the chance for African Americans to fight in combat in the air, they want every chance that is out there to be able to do this. Because the interesting thing about using flight in the military is they didn't feel, African Americans didn't feel like flight and airplanes were something that was solely attributed to white Americans. They would see African Americans who would do plane trips and get their pilot's license and they felt like it was something where they had equal access, equal footing, equal right, equal state, just like white Americans who were serving in the military. Now, the US government decides to allow something they refer to as an experiment. So the Tuskegee Airmen, which is how we know them today, is some of the best um, fighters, is some of the best uh, airmen during World War II, started off as an experiment where the US government never intended for them to see any sort of combat, never intended for any of them to even touch an airplane. Now, these men, because of a need for a group of US pilots who had been trained to sit here and guard the US bombers because US bombers can't hit their targets unless they're flying slow and steady. And they have a lot of moments where they're not able to access a lot of the white viewers who are defending those bombers. So when the US Tuskegee Airmen finally get their chance, even though they were called on as a last resort, by the time you get to the end of the war, they are one of the most requested units to escort those bombers during World War II. Now a lot of people say they never lost a plane. That is not necessarily true. They did have Tuskegee Airmen that they lost. Rarely did they ever lose any of their bombers. Now, you do have 10 Tuskegee Airmen who are coming out of Iowa. The gentleman that you see in this picture to your far left is a gentleman named Robert Williams. Now, him and a gentleman named William Bibb were both from the city of Ottumwa. And Robert Williams, whenever they start writing movies and writing scripts about the Tuskegee Airmen in the 1980s, they have the first sort of Tuskegee Airmen movie that comes out. It's a big blockbuster, nationally renowned movie starring Lawrence Fishburne. Robert Williams is a gentleman who is the on-site expert writing and talking about his experience being trained as a Tuskegee Airman and actually writes part of the script for that movie. So he does have a writer's credit as well as spent time serving as a Tuskegee Airman. Now, in the mid-20th century, when we start talking about people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who were fighting so valiantly for equal access and equal rights for African Americans, we talk about him, and he is a very important and very looming picture because he had a lot of personal sacrifices that he made for progress in the United States. But he's accompanied by thousands and thousands of people, both African American and white, who are also making personal sacrifices to make sure that that progress happened. And one of the things, if you take away nothing else of what I said today, I want you to listen to this moment and listen to what Ms. Edna Griffin did because she is an example of many people who took it upon themselves to support this movement, this nonviolent movement, who took it upon themselves to organize with members of their community to fight for equal access in their cities, in their towns, and in their states. So even though Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was doing things on a large scale level with the power of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference behind him, you have small people like Ms. Andrew Griffin, who's well known to us today, but who organized with just a handful of people, and she and her family took it upon themselves to make changes in their local community. Now, 1948, Miss Senator Griffin and two other gentlemen that she's walking with go into Cash Drugstore in downtown Des Moines. It's a hot summer day. She has her daughter with her, and her daughter's about four years old at the time. Now, if it's a hot summer day, you're at a lunch counter, you're going to get something cool and refresh refreshing and delicious to drink. They want to order beverages for themselves, and her daughter wants ice cream. So they go to the lunch counter. 
she tries to order ice cream for herself and for her daughter, and she and the other gentleman that she's with get turned away. The woman who's about to serve them, she goes over to the drink fountain. They see the manager come and whisper something to her. She comes back to them and says, you can't order food here. We don't serve African Americans, so you guys are gonna have to leave. Now what Miss Edna Griffin does is she does two things. She uses the legal system to her advantage and she starts suing Cash Drug Store for their policies. But she also takes a grassroots approach and she organized protests and sit-ins at the Cash Drug Store lunch counter. Now, why are sit-ins effective? We know they're heavily used and heavily utilized in the mid 20th century, but why do they work? All right. It is basically a financial ultimatum. A lot of people kind of come with this assumption that after these sit-ins were organized and after they've been executed, that people started to sort of change their perception about African Americans, like they were the Grinch in their heart beat three times that day, and all of a sudden everybody loved each other. Very much not the case. We can't necessarily attribute anything towards people's feelings or perceptions of African Americans after this, but if you're a business owner, you own a restaurant, you go into business to do what? To make money. So if you have people who are taking up all the spaces that basically represent your potential income and you refuse to serve them and they continue to stay, there goes your income, there goes your business, there goes your livelihood. Now when we talk about nonviolence, you guys were looking at that video that Eyes on the Prize that Stacey Walker showed. We talk about nonviolence and of course that nonviolence was on behalf of the people who were participating in those sit-ins, not on the people who were watching or agitate, or who are the people who were against that resistance because they encountered all kinds of things from condiments being spilled on them, hot coffee, people beating them, abusing them, them being beaten by cops, them having cigars and cigarettes burned on their skin. And they knew that this is such a mentally and emotionally dangerous process that groups like the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee would even practice and rehearse to mentally prepare themselves to be beaten and slapped and spit on and have things poured on them, thrown in their faces. And it doesn't just take one time of doing this. Think about having to endure this multiple times. And she did this for 1948 and the beginning of 1949, spending a year going back and enduring this treatment. And all the while still having to watch how you carry yourself and how you carry yourself in your family and watch how you look in the public because you guys are also going through a long legal battle. But after about a year, they finally win their case, Cash Drugstore appeals, but they also win the appeals. So after that, he is forced to change his policies and start serving African Americans at his lunch counter. Now later on, once you get to the 1980s, they actually renamed the building that this happened in, in downtown Des Moines. They've called it the Edna Griffin Building up to the 1980s, but then they officially changed the name of the building in downtown Des Moines to the Edna Griffin Building. And anybody who knew Miss Griffin, she was a woman who was uh, very tenacious. She said what she meant, she meant what she said, and she went on to become active in the larger portions of the civil rights movement, including being a participant at the March on Washington in 1963. Now I'm running low on time, so actually one of the last people I want to talk about who is more localized is a woman named Miss Viola Gibson. Now, Miss Viola Gibson is a woman who grew up in the church. Her father was a minister. She grew up playing music in the church. We also have her piano that she played on in the church and grew up to be a minister herself. And a lot of the things that she did and a lot of the perceptions that she had, a lot of the values that she held were very reminiscent of a lot of the things that you hear Dr. King talking about and writing about. She has this amazingly powerful address that she writes as published in the Cedar Rapids Gazette in the 1960s, kind of like Letters from a Birmingham Jail, where she's imploring other people who believe in the Bible, who are Christians, who believe that God did not intend for there to be discrimination and segregation. And she's telling them that if you truly believe these things, then you have to get involved in ending discrimination and segregation because there is no biblical foundation for this, and you cannot be a true Christian if you stand by and allow this to happen. Again, very reminiscent of those things that you hear Dr. King writing about, but doing this on a local level. Now she becomes heavily involved in the civil rights movement after 
her nephew is denied from the city pool in 1942. And she uses that moment to not only become active in fighting against that discrimination there, but become so active that she reignites the NAACP chapter here in Cedar Rapids that had gone defunct for a couple of years. So when you think about people on a local level, if you ever pass on 12th Avenue by Lee Gibson Park, this woman right here rightfully has a school and a park named after her because she organized the people in the local Cedar Rapids community and she continued the fight for equal rights and equal access to make sure that they weren't polluting the African American community and that those black boys and girls had places where they could go to play. All right, thank you guys so much. I know I did a lot of stuff actually.